life. And these are the plans that come out of my copier. <laughs> and uh, see, the, the, they're so big I can't get them on one sheet, so I have to paste them. So people just don't know a thing about World War One yet. It was the beginning of military aviation, so I got into building these. And I think I enjoy building them more than I do the World War Twos because they're more of a challenge and they're more colorful and all the struts and bracing wires and make it interesting. It's a lot of fun to build them. And I began collecting kits of the aircraft that were involved in the Second World War. And, um, I accumulated a whole bunch of them and then I started building them. And I ended up building 426 models of, um, of a model of every aircraft involved in the Second World War. And when I finished, well, I, I didn't have a project, so my wife says, what are you going to do now? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, I should build World War I. So that's I started building World War I. Now these are mostly all scratch built because there are very, very few kits of World War I aircraft. And there isn't a whole lot of knowledge about World War I. Here's, here's one I just finished last night. And that's a Bergeau M5. It was a light bomber. It was a disaster. The plane was terrible. And the reason it was a disaster Look, see, well, okay, look, here, here, look at the, look at the racing wires on it. It was a disaster. It was the way they designed it. And up in front was the, the bombardier gunner, and he controlled the bombs. And he had a machine gun for defense, which wasn't worth much. But look where the cockpit for the pilot is. He had any visibility. He's got radiators. He's got radiators on both sides. Of, his, of the cockpit so he can't see sideways. He can't look to the back because it's too high and he can't look up because of the wing. And even looking forward, he's got to look through the gunner. So they had innumerable crashes with the thing on takeoff and landing. It was a terrible design. Oh, well, we build them from scratch. I have some reference books that uh, have all the data on World War I airplanes, a number of them. And it has the uh, diagrams. They're small. They're little tiny diagrams. And I blow them up on my uh, on my word, on my uh, copier, and then there, none of them have artists' renditions of the aircraft. Of course, there was no color photography in World War One. I. I have black and white pictures; they're very helpful, but I don't have any color pictures. So the artists' renditions uh, uh, are available. And as I said earlier, I don't know whether the artist's rendition is right or not. I have no way of knowing. But absent anything else, I, f <laughs> I copy what the artist, you know, how they pictured it. And uh, that's where I get the information. This airplane exists today, and it's, it was it was never gotten, it's not airworthy anymore. But it was used in the movie Flyboys. Okay. And it was insured, and it's a very early plane. This was the first airplane to fly across the English Channel. Well, actually, the Red Baron had 87 victories during the war. Manfred von Richthofen. Mm -hmm. And most of his victories were not in that airplane. Most of his victories were in this airplane, an Albatross D3 <coughs> and an Albatross D5. That's where he achieved most of his victories. But towards the end of the war, he started flying the Fokker triplane, mm -hmm. Fokker, mm -hmm. F-O-K-K-E-R, D-R-1 triplane. I go to my workshop and I turn on classical music and, and uh, build model airplanes. You, you got to do something in your old age. <laughs> <laughs>